at the beginning of this course, you were promised a bridge from combinatorics to geometry. It is now time to build that bridge and walk over to the other side. Uh, let's start with the sort of geometry that we will end up with. So here's a definition. A set x0, xk of points in Rn, which is a standard Euclidean space, is affinely independent if the vectors x1 minus x0, x2 minus x0, all the way to xk minus x0 are linearly independent in the usual sense. So that's the first definition. Um, and the second one is the following. Um, the geometric simplex spanned by x0 all the way up to xk. Uh, and for the purposes of this definition, I'm not going to assume that they are affinely independent uh, the way they were defined uh, uh, in, in part a. So just any k distinct points in Rn, the geometric simplex spanned by them is the collection, is the subset of Rn given by certain very specific linear combinations. Um, so there will be linear combinations i from, let's see, goes from 0 to k of ti. So these are some scalars, which we'll define in a second. And xi now are, um, are, are points. So I thought of as a vector from uh, the origin to, the, to this point. Um, so what ti's do we allow? So first, we require all the t's to be uh, greater than or equal to 0. And we'd like their sum to equal 1. So um, there are lots of terms uh, for this type of sum. Um, this is called, uh, if you're going to look them up somewhere in a book or on the internet, uh, things like uh, convex combination or, or convex hull are uh, are useful uh, search terms if you're interested okay well um, I don't think this is uh, this is very advanced geometry but just in case uh, you're, you're wondering if this is x0 and x1 um, you are allowing um, sums um, uh, so this would be tx0 plus 1 minus tx1 and t has to be between 0 and 1 so we'll get uh, the line segment. You're not allowed to go past x1. You're not allowed to go back from x0. Um, if you add three points, um, you could probably see why we're doing this. Um, you'd get uh, this set, uh, everything between these three points. Um, life gets complicated when you have more points. Um, uh, you, you build something like this. Um, the rule is that basically um, you have to contain all the points that are um, all the xi's, and if there's any line uh, between them, then that also has to be contained. These are called convex regions. Anyway, um, so that's that's the definition of uh, uh, of the geometric simplex and uh, and affine independence. So these are just two basic, um, almost. I mean, these linear algebraic notions that, that play a role in the geometry of Euclidean space. Okay, so if you give me a list of points, um, I can build this geometric simplex spanned by them. Um, okay, so now we're ready to start looking at subspaces of Euclidean space um, Who's, uh, which are defined in terms of simplices of a simplicial complex. So let K be a simplicial complex. Uh, 
and phi a map from the vertices k0 of the simplicial complex to Rn for some n. We don't care which one yet. Um, the geometric realization and this is off k with respect to phi is the union so uh, I'm going to write it like this it's sort of like an absolute value sign, but it just indicates that it's a space, not a simplicial complex. And then I'll put a phi to indicate that it depends on this function uh, taking your vertices to Rn. Uh, so this is going to be a union uh, over all the simplices in K, not just the vertices, of something that I'll call um, sigma sub K. So this something, sigma sub, sorry, not sigma sub K, that's silly. Uh, I'll call it sigma sub uh, phi. So this is something that depends on phi, and it depends on the simplex sigma, and then k is a union of these, and this is going to be a subspace of Rn. Um, so really, I've said that this is some subspace of Rn that's a union of these tinier pieces that are indexed by the simplices. So all we have to do now is, is figure out what these pieces are. And of course, the reason I've defined geometric simplex of the, uh, upstairs is, is as follows, uh, is that these pieces is the geometric simplex spanned by the vertices, um, the phi images of vertices contained in sigma. So the important thing, I guess, is that if you give me a simplicial complex and you give me a way to send all of its vertices into Rn, I can take each simplex, build a geometric simplex, take the union of all these geometric simplices, and get a topological space that's just living inside Rn. Um, and what we'd like to do is understand how this depends on phi. Uh, so, so you could have um, fairly unfortunate choices. I mean, this this um, uh, geometric realization may may have very little to do with k. So, a particularly poor choice of examples. I'm going to write bad example. Is uh, if you imagine phi is the map that sends every vertex to zero. So all the geometric realizations of simplicity, so zero being the origin in Rn, so or any single point. So all this entire space, k, phi, if you change the definition, will just be that single point that every vertex went to. Now, uh, this is not a good idea. This is not a space that has anything to do with the simplicial. This is a poor way to uh, impose geometry in a simplicial complex. Um, so what we want is is a is a class of fees, a wide class of fees for which um, this geometric realization does not depend on phi. Um, and so let's let's define that class next. Um, so phi from k zero to Rn is called an uh, affine embedding. And if you want to be honest, uh, this is an affine embedding of K in Rn. If it is injective, what does injective mean? Hmm, let's think. Um, it means that if I have two different vertices in K0, they should not get to the same, uh, they should not have the same image in Rn. So that definitely rules out our bad example. Um, and phi of K0, which is some subset of points in Rn, is affinely independent. Great. 
So this affine independence is a way uh, to make sure nothing degenerate happens. If you don't end up um, um, sending a two simplex to a line, remember we've been drawing them with triangles. You really want a two simplex, a, a solid two simplex, to look like a filled-in triangle and not a one-dimensional squished, uh, um, squished object. Okay, great. So um, there's one and only one theorem in this uh, in this particular lecture, and here it is. The topology of K sub phi does not depend, and I'm going to highlight the not, depend on phi as long as phi is an affine embedding. Okay, so you may want to think about what I mean by topology. You might want to think a little bit about what um, I mean by uh, this uh, topology not depending on uh, the choice of phi. I mean, if you go back up to the definition, it's still in a red box near the top of the screen, I hope. Um, then it very clearly, phi is being used to define everything, right? It's going to be used to define where all the synthesis go. So what, what does it mean to say that this is not dependent on phi? Um, so really the statement is that if I take two different affine embeddings and compute the realization with respect to one and respect to the other, then they're homeomorphic, which means that there's a continuous map from the first to the second, another one from the second back to the first, which is um, uh, which gives identities no matter which way you compose them. So, um, so let's prove that. Um, so let phi and psi, that's a terrible psi, so we'll make a better one, from k0 to rn be any two affine embeddings. Um, okay, so these are both point sets in Rn. Um, they, there are as many points as there are vertices in K0 because by definition of affine embedding, uh, the maps phi and psi have to be injective. So um, if you had 50 points in K0, the image of phi is 50 red points and the image of psi is 50 um, uh, blue points. Uh, and there are affine embeddings. So define, um, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the thing to do is uh, for K0, uh, let's just label the vertices to make my life easier in this proof. Let's say there are K, little k vertices. Um, so that's all the vertices. Uh, define the vectors in Rn given by, so uh, I want xi to be the image of the ith vertex under phi minus the image of the zeroth vertex under phi, yi to be the same thing, but I replace the phi's by the size. So I'm getting vectors in Rn, two different families, k of them. Um, and this, of course, is ranging over for all i in uh, 1 through k. Okay. Um, by the affine independence, both sets of vectors, um, x and yi, where again, i is ranging over the same 1 through k, uh, are linearly linearly, one of these days I will learn how to spell linear, independent. So both of them span k-dimensional subspaces of Rn. What that means uh, by basic laws of linear algebra is that there exists some matrix and I really mean invertible matrix
uh, it's a matrix, let's call it M, from Rn to Rn, sending Xi to Yi. Now, it turns out this matrix constitutes a homeomorphism from k phi to k psi. Um, and really, uh, it's an invertible matrix, and you can check it is sending um, uh, the points and the uh, and the one-dimensional simplices, their realizations, and the two-dimensional simplices exactly from the first realization to the second one. Um, and because it's an invertible matrix, its inverse is going to send everything back. Um, so so that's it. Uh, no matter what phi and psi are, uh, as long as they're affinely independent, um, the, there's no choice about the homeomorphism type. You cannot escape the homeomorphism type of, um, of the geometric realization. So uh, because of this uh, theorem, you can define the geometric realization of a simplicial complex K is defined to be this K uh, phi for any affine embedding phi. It doesn't matter which one we choose. If all you care about is homeomorphism, then uh, then there is a definition. Um, and is there anything else we should know about this? Well, uh, no, I think uh, I think that's that's uh, that's important. So so this is uh, this is it, uh, and we'll call it. Just k. I mean, now that we know it doesn't really depend on phi in any serious way, we can remove the phi from it uh, uh, from the notation entirely. Okay. Um, lots of linear algebra, lots of theorem proving, maybe not enough pictures. So um, I'll, I'll end the lecture by um, by showing you a few geometric realizations. I mean, the whole point is we can now, uh, I mean, we have been doing this already, but now because we have a theorem, um, it's justified to draw simplices the way we've been doing with dots for vertices and lines for uh, one-dimensional simplices and triangles filled in for two-dimensional simplices and so forth. So, um, so, I mean, maybe one question is, what fee should we use? What fee is safe to use? So, um, my answer to this question usually uh, is whatever's convenient. Maybe that's not a very uh, helpful answer. Uh, so, I will say the standard basis. So, that's the that's the vectors which uh, which have zero everywhere except a single spot and then there's a one. So if you use the standard basis vectors, um, so here's the uh, uh, the geometric realization. Uh, we we defined uh, solid and uh, hollow uh, simplices. So writing del k for the solid and boundary del k for the hollow uh, k simplex. Here are some pictures of realizations. See which ones should we draw? Which ones can we draw? Um, two, three, four, uh, 
um, and and let's actually draw Euclidean space. So there are the axes. So um, uh, the solid one simplex maybe is one. So here's the realization of the solid one simplex. So if you remember the solid one simplex has two vertices. So you want to use a standard basis. So you send, let's say the vertex zero here, the vertex one here, and then use um, uh, the, the standard thing. You, you get a line segment here. So that's the geometric one simplex living inside R2. And now you can ask all sorts of questions. How many pieces does it have? What does it look like? Um, okay, that was maybe not the most exciting one. So if you have the geometric two simplex, um, it has three vertices. So it looks like this, 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 and you connect them and fill in the blank. Uh, by the way, the, this has equation, if you actually use the standard basis, this has, uh, if this is x and this is y, then this is the line segment. It's a piece of the line defined by the equation x plus y equals 1. Similarly, if this was z, x, and y, this would be x plus y plus z equals 1, and so on. Okay, now we can cheat a little bit um, and get pictures for the hollow uh, simplices. Um, so delta 0, sorry, not delta 0, delta 1 boundary. That's the hollow one simplex, its realization. Well, all you have to do is go back to the realization of the non-hollow, the solid one, and remove the top simplex. So this is disconnected, uh, unlike the other two. Uh, and similarly, if you want to draw a picture uh, of that, uh, the, the hollow two simplex, you go back to the solid two simplex, uh, the vertices are what they used to be, the standard basis vectors, the endpoints of those, and you draw the one-dimensional simplices, and you do not draw the two-dimensional simplex because um, uh, that's the one you have to remove to get to the hollow one. So uh, maybe maybe you've seen the pattern now already, uh, but let me uh, let me say it anyway. Note. The geometric realization of the hollow uh, of the solid simplex. Let's do that one first. Um, delta k is homeomorphic to. I'm a topologist. There is no difference between saying is or is homeomorphic to for a pair of spaces. Can't really tell the difference between them anymore. Uh, is homeomorphic to um, a d-dimensional, sorry, a k-dimensional disk. Uh, so a k-dimensional disk is exactly what you think uh, um, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus all the way up to xk squared uh, living in k-dimensional space uh, less than equal to 1. So it's the filled-in ball in whatever dimensional uh, Euclidean space you're in. And the hollow uh, this is exactly its boundary. So this is homeomorphic to a k minus one dimensional sphere. Um, so the zero sphere is just two points, and you see that in the third picture that we've drawn, and uh, the one sphere is just a circle, and you sort of see the, the hollow triangle that's, uh, that's homeomorphic to a circle. Well, uh, so hopefully you now see the beginnings of geometry entering the picture um, in a very visceral way, and uh, we will see much more of this in the lectures to come.